Even a lot of times they show up thinking that the wife is the problem. Why can't she see how great I am yes. and get on board this is our with how great this is? And then you get about 10 minutes in and you're like, oh, she's the one telling the truth. He's dying. This is hurting their family. Um, he doesn't have proper boundaries. Lindley, I think you would say that church planning is an emotional experience. I would say anything in the church is, is an, an emotional, emotional experience. experience. Well, years ago when we planted a church together, we met a guy named Brian Barley, mm -hmm. who was at that time like doing incredible work in downtown city center Denver, which is one of the hardest places mm -hmm. to start a church. He was so gracious to have coffee with us. I remember walking away and being like, that guy is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Here we are years later. It's been probably 10 years. We've moved to Nashville. God's brought him to Nashville to do an amazing project with Voice of the Heart, which helps people, particularly those in ministry, process emotion. Mm -hmm. And recently when Brian and I got together for coffee, I told you, I was like, man, this guy, he's really on the front edge of talking about these conversations about emotions. We should have him on the show. Right. So today we're really excited to have an old friend, former church planter colleague in Denver back on the show with a lot to share about unhealthy emotions in ministry and what to do with them. Yeah, I, I feel like we need to say too how I think sometimes people hear unhealthy emotions and they check out. Um, so, I mean, I feel like we should set it up, too, of that. It's very practical of ways to name things, feel things, um, heal them, that sort of thing. In the same way that Jesus did. Yes. You know, he makes this point as we talk that, you know, to be emotional is to be a human being. Yeah. I just think they're trigger words. Sometimes an emotional health is getting to be that way to where yeah. people are like, oh, I've heard it. I don't want to listen right. to that again. But this was very, very, I thought it came from a different angle and very interesting. Yeah. Let's roll the conversation. Well, welcome to The Glass House. We are excited to have an old friend, but a new friend on the show, Brian Barley. Brian, introduce yourself a little bit and then we'll get into what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I am a former Colorado church planter. Yes, you mm -hmm. are. Like y'all. Uh, spent almost 12 years in Colorado. Recently moved to Nashville nine months ago uh, with my wife. My wife and I will be married 17 years this summer. Four kids, uh, 10, 6, 4, and 3. Uh, so we're in it. I do a few different things vocationally, but I think like what's most pertinent to this conversation is one of the 12 good reasons that brought me to Nashville was to help my mentor, Chip Dodd, who has been really involved in my life since the fall of 2019, which we can get into the hmm. how that happened. Um, he kind of dreamed alongside a guy named Dr. Colton Shannon, uh, who had done clinical work under Chip for several years of opening sort of his legacy practice that would be the continuation of his work. Uh, most people know him from the book, The Voice of the Heart, and moved here to help open the Voice of the Heart Center, out of which I do uh, coaching and counseling. I'm not a, I'm not a licensed uh, therapist, but I do coaching and counseling yeah. out of that. Mm -hmm. So the core of this book, if you're unfamiliar with, if you're not familiar with Chip Dodd's work, it's, it's really beginning to learn how to listen to the emotions of your heart, mm -hmm. and then how do you decipher and turn those into something that moves you to positive and not to the impaired state? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's basically trying to say one, uh, you know, it's always interesting because I think men in particular are like, oh, I'm not very emotional. And by what usually what they mean when they say that is I don't have outbursts of crying. <laughs> what, what we're trying to do is lay the foundation to say no, uh, to say I'm not emotional is non as nonsensical as saying I'm not intellectual or I'm not physical. Like there's a a component in which God made you where you are emotional. And so consequently you are either emotionally healthy or unhealthy. So that's kind of pillar one. Pillar two is if you want to start going down this path, you understand just in the same way that there are, you know, three primary colors or 26 letters in the alphabet. There are eight core emotions that give us, they're like the entryway into understanding the emotional depths of the way that God designed us. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, just because my personality, I've I've probably went years without crying. I mean, and that's not true right, right now. I'm a little more um, of a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> but beforehand, there have been years, and so I was like, oh, I'm not emotional. Like I would have people say to me, I'm just a woman who feels all the feels, and I was like, well, thank goodness I'm not like that. Yeah. But turns out, I do. I just wasn't. I was just burying them. Right. Like I wasn't crying about yeah. them, but I really was feeling them and. It wasn't healthy. I think yeah. why this is, it's such an important issue for pastors and wives because like in our family, emotions make me uncomfortable. 
Mm, why is like that? last night we were having a family uh, closer. We do these occasionally. We get all our kids in the room. Yeah. We just close the day out with conversation. It's the first night of the summer. Kind of we got to do that. And one of my one of my kids got angry. Mm. And the whole room just kind of turned sour. Mm. And so for me, even even at 47, I'm always trying to think like, how do we avoid yeah, yeah. some of these unpleasant emotions right. so we can live our real lives? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of times with the eight core emotions, if, if you go through each of them, most people's initial response is there's seven bad ones and there's only one good one. 100%. Because the last one is gladness. And most people the, are like, how do I get to the gladness without avoiding the when seven? When we began our counseling journey, we went in and the guy showed us all eight and he goes, why well, is there only one good one? Right. <laughs> exactly. That's what everybody yeah. always says. And I think one of the things in our work that we try to help institute in people is like, they're not really positive or negative. They're more neutral. They just are. And their gifts, their resources, their tools you know, almost in the same way, the image a lot of times we'll use is to say, you know, in the same way, if you go camping, which that's a great Colorado uh, mm -hmm. analogy, even though I never camped, I think camping's kind of dumb, but that's a whole conversation <laughs> for another time. I never became a camper either. Yeah. We, we spent a lot of time as a species, like getting inside, you know, and so the like ops outside for a lot of money. Cause you know, we all went to REI in yes. Denver and you're like, that's a very expensive trip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but if you do go camping, right? You have different tools to encounter certain realities. That's really the way it is. Like we're trying to help people just live life on life's terms. Life in a broken and fallen world ravaged by sin is like a wilderness. You're going to encounter different realities. God's given us these different tools or resources that are these different emotions to be able to uh, step into not just merely survival, but thriving and flourishing to encounter what life in a broken and fallen world throws at us. So it's like a lot of times people will say, oh, I don't like loneliness. Well, loneliness, if it's healthy, is a real gift because loneliness lets me be in touch with the fact that I need other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, if I can just own the fact that I'm lonely, it lets me take action, right? Like your, your, your emotions are either going to come out in healthy ways or they're going to come out sideways. You don't get to opt out of it. That's the most important thing. Yeah. You don't get to opt out. You don't get to turn it off. It'll just come out in an unhealthy way, an impaired way. So like loneliness, for example, if I own it, if I acknowledge it, it leads me to reach out to a friend mm -hmm. and just say, hey, I really miss you. Could we get together and have lunch? Where you think about the impaired expressions of loneliness of maybe just saying, you know, I sort of numb it by scrolling on my phone for hours upon time and get just enough illusion of community to, yeah. to hide my need for the real thing. Hmm. That's really good. Um, and well, so, yeah, we're, we're just trying to say, like, don't view it through the lens of it's positive or negative it it is and it can lead you into health or impaired living i'm a huge fan of this conversation i think it's one that the church has not historically spent yeah. much time on yeah. we've made discipleship more out to be doctrinal or right. let's get the right facts in your head about who jesus is right. the emotional piece to me is so important it's become more important as i've walked through this transition of life way yeah i'd love for you to tell a little bit about yeah. your transition from church planning to where you are today because i think it's a big shaper Sure. Of your thinking. Or whatever happened in 2019. Yeah, like how did I get connected to Take Chip? us back you to You said it. something yeah. about that, 2019. And I think one of the things, I mean, to your point of it not being a big conversation in the church, I, I think one of our burdens, my burden, is to say, you know, I think a lot of the emotional health uh, conversation has been co-opted by like unhealthily progressive expressions of the church that want to leave the scriptures. That's not me and that's not us. Like we're just trying to robustly follow Jesus. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, Jesus was deeply emotional. If Jesus shows us what it means to be fully human, then to be fully human is to be emotional. And Jesus is somebody who his insides were constantly matching the outside realities he was encountering. He did not encounter outside realities. For example, he didn't, he didn't encounter outside wickedness, like when he went into the temple and say, sort of like, you know, God is sovereign and he's over all things and it'll all work out in the end and all things work for good and it's going to be fine. This is no big deal. Like his anger matched the wickedness that he was encountering. His loneliness in the garden encountered his abandonment by his friends in the moment that he needed them hmm. the most. And so I just want to be really explicit That's about good. this because a lot of times I think people hear emotions and they're like, oh, you're just saying, you're talking about like following your heart basically. Mm -hmm. We're not about feely, following your heart. Just feely. Yeah. We're about, we're about facing your heart. We're about facing the way that God designed you. I think even in the cultural moment, 
so much of the epicenter of the ethical dilemmas of the day is this question. Are we self-made or are we God-made, right? Are we one or the other? Does meaning bubble up from within or does God define the parameters of how we were created? All we're saying is a big component, not exclusively, but a significant component of the way you were made is you're emotional. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand how to do that in a healthy way as opposed to an unhealthy way. So it's I just really want to say that on the front Really end. well said. And you've always done this well? Yeah, I was born doing this great. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, you know, so a little bit about my background. Uh, I didn't really grow up in church. I came to faith at 18. I uh, went to the University of South Carolina, met my wife, uh, went to Southeastern Seminary. Uh, when I was there, got a real vision of church planting. At that time, you know, 2008, 2009, the leading voices mm -hmm. were Mark Driscoll, Tim Keller, uh, J.D. Greer, who was the pastor of the church that I ended up going to and did a church planting residency at, and was sent out of uh, the summit in uh, 2011 and uh, moved to downtown Denver City Center, Denver. You know, it's interesting for me, and I'm not going to project this on the environments I came from. I have to kind of own my own stuff. So the assumption I came, brought into church planting was, you know, if we think about the way we were made through head, hands, and heart, you know, we think, we do, and we feel. Uh, feeling was not on the radar at all. And I sort of carried in a posture that said, if my theology is sound and if my entrepreneurial aptitude and grit is strong enough, I will be successful. And I found myself in the fall of 2011, you know, our church never, like our church never grew like y'all's church. Y'all's church grew way fast. I think you're- You were in a different context. Right? Yeah, but right. you're also like a different level of leader than, you know, we all have our lanes and y'all are different, you know, leaders in terms of like quality and aptitude than, than what I bring. Um, and so, we never grew like gangbusters, but we were growing in city center Denver. And, you know, it's like we had a core team of 25 and it went like 25 to 40 in the first year. And we baptized one person who was really unlikely to come to faith. But it was like that was really good for city center Denver. And I remember that fall literally having an a, 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 it was like a Thursday afternoon at three o'clock and I was in my basement. I mean, I looked like something out of like a depression textbook. Um, like I was on my couch laying down and just being like, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to anybody. And um, and it wasn't like I was suicidal, uh, but I was kind of like, if a tornado hits downtown Denver and it hits my house, I'll be kind of okay with it. Mm. Um, you know, it was definitely impaired living. It wasn't like I really wanted, and I, I couldn't really solve it because my theology was, I think, still sound, and I was working really hard, and I was pretty good at what I was doing. Kind of in desperation, I was at a church planner gathering. A guy who was more experienced than me, you know, I was talking to, and he was like, have you heard of this book called Voice of the Heart? And uh, I was like, I've never heard of that book. And he's like, you should read it. And I did, and I was like, this makes no sense to me, but it, but it feels like maybe this is the beginning of a new journey for me. We pretty quickly integrated it into like some of the discipleship, just rhythms of our church. Um, 2016, my wife was pregnant with our second kid. Our oldest is adopted, but so this was our first birth. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at the hospital in downtown Denver, uh, Rose Medical Center, mm -hmm. and we were at a birthing class and I'd been having these fainting spells and like chest pains from just pace of life and I think not knowing how to live with heart. I passed out um at our birthing class not because of like some video that i wasn't supposed to you know see or something like that but just from like i think it was just i think it was probably panic attacks and just overwork and you know so i'm i'm in the hospital getting wheeled from the birthing class to the er and my wife you know is giving me this like justifiably like valid look of like if this doesn't kill you i'm gonna kill you kind of kind of <laughs> like thing um I wish that would say that led me to uh, getting the kind of like help and support I needed. 2019, we did a major, we had bought our building in downtown, but led a major kind of giving campaign, which y'all have lived through too and know what that takes out of you. Mm -hmm. Same symptoms were coming up again. I think panic attacks, um, fainting spells. And I was like, before this gets me hospitalized again, I need to reach out and just ask for help I reached out to Chip on Twitter, which I love this man, but 
he is he's he's an unlikely person to respond to you on Twitter. <laughs> he he sent me a message right back and said, "Call me." I called him. Hmm. Within about 30 minutes, he diagnosed me that I had the language of emotional health, but I had no idea how to do it. You know, I could talk about it, but I didn't know how to practice it. Um, he told me the truth, um, which is what I really needed. And then uh, we formed a, a counseling and mentorship That's awesome. relationship from there. That's really good. You know, I think a lot of times with emotional health, people are kind of like, what do you do? Um, and so it's like I had concepts without practice, you know, so... I think like in terms of the experience of emotional health, it's sort of like a board game. You know, anytime you talk about a board game or understand concepts of a board game, it's not very compelling and it doesn't really work, right? Nobody's sat around and l talked about the rules of a board game and been like, that let's sounds play, great, let's, let's, let's do that. it. Yeah. You know, and inevitably what somebody says is we need to play a few rounds, mm -hmm. let's do it. So I could like talk about it and I think that's actually one of the great vulnerabilities of the cultural moment where therapeutic language has been increasingly popularized, even at times weaponized. It's like we can talk about it, but we don't actually do it. And so like the doing it, what I wasn't doing was I was not living the process. <laughs> the process is pretty simple. One, feel your feelings. So actually like feeling them, name, feel, deal. That's feeling your feelings. Two, so like which of these, you know, which of these eight core emotions am I actually feeling in this moment um, rather than just internalizing it and just existing in my anxiety and then eventual depression. Mm -hmm. Two, so feel your feelings, one. Two, tell the truth to God, self, and others who are appropriate. That's step two. I wasn't doing that at all. You know, I'm just like, I'm fine. I'm great. I'm fine. I'm great. Uh, and then three, uh, letting go of control and trusting God to own the process because God does own the process. And when we surrender control, rather than in our anxiety operating in a place of manipulating outcomes in the future, God steps in and does for, ourse does for us what we can't do for ourselves. And that experience that integrates with real living becomes so beautiful and tangible, we don't want to go back mm -hmm. to control. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I could talk about it, but I wasn't actually doing any mm -hmm. of it. So we've been having this conversation lately, Lindley and I, and we were hoping you could solve a fight. Oh, great. That's, yeah. <laughs> Which one? Okay, so Which one? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know exactly how to word this, but we've had a couple of conversations lately where we've both felt the freedom to be honest. Yeah. And one of us has said, I'm just sharing my honest feelings. No, one of us is you. Because yeah. I'm like, what, what's a fake feeling? <laughs> like an honest feeling is an honest feeling. Yeah. Like, it, don't tell me a lie. Okay, so... What I, what I mean when I say I'm sharing my honest feelings is that I'm not filtering this right now. I'm yeah. raw. I'm telling you exactly right now where I'm at. Yeah. The challenge with that is where I'm at may not be a healthy spot. Sure. It, it may not be a good to trust that feeling. Yeah. So how do you, how do you like, like even in marriage, you share your raw feelings, but in a way that is edifying and helpful without being destructive. Yeah. Can I add to this real quick yeah. though? I'm going to give my spin on this. Both he and I in the last five years have said, and this is okay to share, I'm sure, at different seasons have said, I, I just feel like God's abandoned us. Mm. And like, I think that's okay to say out loud. Yeah. And, and, that, and people have felt that before, like God's just silent or he's not speaking. Right. But at a point I'm like, but that's not scripturally sound. Like God yeah. never forsakes us or leaves us. So not that that's helpful to say in the moment. Right. I think we just get stuck in knowing what do we do with this? We have to differentiate between the feeling and the conclusion. Mm. Um, so I think sometimes where we say, where we get in trouble is to say, um, you know, it, it's interesting even, I mean like there are times in the Psalms where David's like, it feels like you've abandoned me. Yeah. You know, like even, I, I'm always just passionate about integrating our work into scriptures to say, the Psalms are a great example of feeling your feelings, telling your truth, trusting God. I mean, there's a lot of Psalms that end unresolved, mm -hmm. right? Where it's just like David giving his heart to God. And it's kind of like, you are a safe and secure, honest place to land that I can be honest. And this Psalm can end and I don't have to clean it up to it's, you know, every kind of yeah. possible. Didn't tie a bow on it. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I, I would say, again, you're going to, feel. It's not like you get to turn it off. I think we have to differentiate to say, now what that feeling does not give you is justification to arrive 
at a conclusion of which you were sort of judge, jury, and executioner of. So for example, like the feeling of abandonment, right? So like I would hear that, I would say there's a lot of fear Mm -hmm. in there, right? There's a lot of maybe loneliness uh, that's in there. Um, There could be guilt or shame, like did we do something to deserve this? Did we make bad decisions that led to this? I would say those feelings, like we, 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 if we're doing healthy confrontation, healthy confrontation is not, I feel this and therefore it means this and you're like this and you did this and you made me feel this way. Healthy confrontation is just like, I, okay, healthy confrontation this moment would say, if we're talking about, you're, you're almost talking about healthy confrontation with God. Hey God, I feel scared that you've abandoned us. Like, can we just start mm-hmm. there without having to jump to cleaning it all up? Yeah. Um, as well as I think with one another, in terms of healthy confrontation, where we might say, hey Ben, you know, I feel scared when you did X that it means this. Is that what you meant when you did that? Mm -hmm. Where we get in trouble, and I mean, we can talk about circle security and dynamics and marriage and stuff like this, and again, we've had the same fight 10,000 times like any of us who've been married for more than six months have. Where we get in trouble is if I said, hey Ben, you, don't love me because you did this. You actually made me feel lonely and alone. And that means boom, 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 boom. And we go into like mind reading. That's where I think we're, Mm. we're um, maybe not sharing our feelings in the, in the healthiest of way. The other thing I'll just add to this is we have to build, and this is, we can talk about circle security, but it's like, we have to build a tolerance that because you feel something, I'm kind of being you in this situation because you feel something. I didn't make that happen and it's not a judgment on me, which I think in marriage is like the hardest thing really hard. to feel. Um, Cause I get angry when she has unpleasant emotions because I immediately think she's blaming me. Right. I'm responsible. For, yeah. So now I need to own this. Right. Which is really unhealthy. Right. That doesn't ever lead to a good place. No, I feel the exact same way. Like I immediately when my wife, who I assume will watch this and, and, and she will be saying amen to the screen right now. Every single time, I mean, I work in this space, It's this is how hard it is. <laughs> Every single time she has a problem about anything, I instinctually jump to, she's telling me I'm not good, she's telling me I'm not su- sufficient, she tells me I'm lazy, she's this telling is me your that, fault. this is my fault. Like, and, and she's just saying like, I'm frustrated at the kids. She's not saying you made me frustrated at the kids. She's not saying you should work more so I have a nanny so I don't have to watch the kids. She's saying <laughs> she's just she's just saying a feeling and I just don't have the tolerance to say that is frustrating. I don't know why I can't do that. I'm working on it. <laughs> but it's just like that's It's a, hard. It is very very hard. So, in this conversation we were having. So Rich Mullins has a song called Hard to Get. Have you heard it? Mm-mm. It's on the Jesus album. He describes God as playing hide and seek. Mm. And recently in one area of my life, I was just telling Lane, like, I feel like God's intentionally like hiding. Mm. Like I'm, I'm reaching out, but I'm getting nothing in return. Mm. And it's part of my experience as a human being to just sometimes, you know, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like I just sometimes have moments like that. Yeah. So when I'm sharing this with her and, and I'm, I do the same thing. I think her natural inclination is to help me see it straight. And I appreciate what she's trying to do. She's trying to help me like see this like holistically from scripture and not just be stuck in my feelings. Right. But there's something inside my soul that the minute she starts doing that, I just shut her off. Mm. And I, I can't figure out what is that? Mm. I think it's fear. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What do you, yeah, like what? Oh, no. I, I, th- I think I know what it is. What do you think? I, I think the more I've gotten into therapy and stuff, I think, you know, the expression, you have to feel it to heal it. Mm. I'm trying to feel this thing with its full weight so that I can deal with it. Yeah. And if you cut me off at the past with scripture or a reminder of the, of the truth, it doesn't allow me to get healed in that deepest place. Like I need to feel all of the depths of the possibility of being abandoned by God. Mm. So that I can just like, it's like doing laundry. I can sort it and fold it and put it away. Yeah. Put a bow on it? Put a bow on it. Yeah. But no, I do think like, not that I can solve it, but I can just feel it. 
more deeply. It's kind of like you said with scrolling on Instagram. If I just kind of entertain the thought throughout the day, I feel it, but not to the depths I need to do something about it. And I do say, I mean, I, I think this is the really hardest part about marriage is that, you know, iron sharpens iron. We're here to like make each other better, but we're also here to support each other and just be there for one another. Yeah. And so how do you find that yeah. balance? Of, That's a great way to put it. You know, when is it my duty to challenge him? And I would think pastors, pastors, wives listening, there are a lot of wives out there who probably need to issue a challenge to their husbands mm-hmm. for different reasons. Sure. Like your wife needed to do for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so I, you know, that it does bother me when people are like, well, you know, they just is how they are. And yeah. I'm like, well, that's not fair because none of us should ever stop striving to improve in some ways. Sure. So I, that's where I think it's really, really hard because I, if I were a more patient person, a more tender person, I probably would be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you're right. still dealing with this. Yeah. Um, that's not my tendency. I kind of wish it was. It's just not. And I, I, after 23 years of marriage, I've tried to change it. I can't. And so after a point, I'm like, okay, like how long are we going to whine about this? And how long are we going to actually, mm. like when are we going to start doing something about it? Mm. Which is upsetting to him. Yeah. And we do that. He does the same thing to me, like vice versa. We go yeah. back and forth. We he's, both have separate issues that he's we heard chronically deal about with. Things, and he had to sit in the car with me the other day and say, you need to do this blank. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it was true. It was fair for him to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always want to be careful not to give like sweeping judgments on complex of like course. nuances yes. that if this was a different conversation, I would ask like a bunch of like clarifying questions. I mean, I think the biggest thing is that in marriage, it's really difficult because you're, you know, there's not, hopefully there's not a closer relationship that you have, but you can't go to a place of enmeshment of like, we are responsible for one another's feelings. And I think there has to be a a healthy detachment and love to say, you and I are separate before God. And um, I am with you on this journey, but you have, you know, like you gotta do your own work. And I can also need to trust what God is gonna do uh, in your life as well. And so sometimes that just means, and I think this is a self-awareness piece too, like do we lean more kind of gas or do we lean more break and you know, which way do we need to lean? Like I definitely lean like you do. I'm in your M8, like big challenger. Mm-hmm. Um, like why are we whining about this? Let's fix this. You can, I'm in recovery as mm-hmm. you can, as you mm-hmm. can tell uh, in this. But to say, you know what, like my wife has a relationship with God. Um, I'm not the Holy Spirit in our relationship. And I mean, you know, there's something sacred about wrestling with God. Yeah. I mean, it's so sacred. He named his people after that very reality. Um, the ones who strive or wrestle or struggle with God. And so, well, I think where people, if they get excited about this, and I've done this before too, where they make a mistake is they see, they hear, tell the truth. And what they interpret is, I'm just going to say what I'm feeling at all times to everyone. And they can like kind of take it or leave it. What I'm not advocating for is that actually, I think, I mean, we can talk about this as much as you want to. I'll stay here as long as you want to. But um, what I'm not advocating for is a pastor going into staff meeting and being like, guys, I don't, I don't know if we're going to stay married if I keep leading this church. Hmm. Even though that might've been a really honest conversation that y'all had had the night before. Um, And I think it's just part of the process of being honesty about like what's really going on in in somebody's life and stopping pretending. But I would say that there's gotta be somebody you tell that to. Okay, so who's appropriate? Who's not going to fire you because they immediately hear that about you and get mm-hmm. suspicious about you? Mm-hmm. Who can handle that and to say, hey, I've actually talked to a bunch of people who that's a really normal question that they're wrestling with and struggling with and, and even have the, the, the skills to um, assess, hey, are you saying that because it was just, it's just been a rough season? Are you saying that because like, no, this is like a real probability. Okay, we got to handle those situations in, in different ways. But again, I think sometimes where this this goes sideways is people get really excited about telling the truth. Um, and it's like, no, this is where we practice healthy boundaries. right? The imagery we always use for healthy boundaries is like a house. And um, you let some people on the porch. You let some people into the foyer. You let some people into the kitchen. And you only let you know one person into the bedroom. And I think a lot of times what happens is, especially in the cultural moment where people get very excited about emotional health, is they let people into the bedroom immediately. This is like, 
you know, again, generalization. This is like Gen Zers who have never met each other getting in their first small group and talking about the most traumatic thing that ever happened to them the very first time they talked. I would say that's inappropriate vulnerability. Hmm. It's like you should get to know one another and then figure out, are you a safe person to tell this to? Hmm. That's good. You know, that's does, that, does that help? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. And it takes years to sift through that. Yeah. The vulnerability piece is so important, but I, I can think of times like when I was preaching, I just felt led to share something and right. later thought that was so oversharing. Yeah, I, I, I lean the same way. Yeah. I, I, I lean the same way where I think I was inappropriately, again, inappropriate a lot of times in these contexts because inter, interpret right. is like sexualized. That's not what I'm saying, but just saying, hey, I, you know, my, I actually listened to a podcast episode where you said this once and it kind of scared the heck out of me because my, I heard my wife say the same thing. She was like, I found out something about you on stage that you've never talked to me about. Right. And it was this moment, like for me, I was, that's, I think it's, coercive vulnerability you know i I knew how to kind of like almost weaponize it and use it to give uh the illusion of closeness without actual closeness yes so like strangers were feeling close to me my wife was feeling distant from me and so that's been a big thing even in my own recovery of like hey i don't i don't want my wife to find out things about me on stage for example we we just had an incident like this i wish i could say i've grown out of this but we got into a pretty big hurtful disagreement about something in our house and like within a week or two I was preaching at a church and I just I didn't tell her but I just felt led to share the story yeah and I I I truly did not subconsciously think I'm gonna tell this story so I come out looking really good right but that's how it came out yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way we always. Yeah. He neglected to mention that I cried for four days because it hurt me so bad, you know. And yeah. then I was like, "Wait, why are you the hero of this?" Story? So I, yeah. I, I didn't mean to cast myself as the right. hero, but like behind behind my heart, maybe was this this little motivation of tell people that you repent well. Yeah, like that'll that'll help them trust you, so you can get stronger response to your sermon or right. more engagement to your sermon or right. whatever. Like we as preachers, we figured out ways to use vulnerability when we need it. Right. But then to not use it when we need to use it for personal. Right. Or to say, you know, for example, not to turn this into like my own therapy session for you or something like that. But I would say, but I would say, you know, if a pastor, which I think any pastor is done, right? You're, you're just desperate. You're trying to generate content. Um, family <laughs> content is good content, yeah, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, and, and to say, Hey, you know, have y'all consented that that's something that's going to be shared publicly? But even to say, hey, you know, we want to have a rhythm in our life where we can be transparent about our challenges in marriage because everybody has challenge. It's the most difficult relationship you're going to have, right? As beautiful as it is to be like, okay, hey, instead of it being like the two of us and then from the stage, could it be the two of us and could it be three other men that you know, that you trust, that the stuff stays with? And there's no sort of like public reward or payoff for it. That's like a circle of security, right? Where hopefully, you know, that would be like, I have relationships like that where it's like, it might just be me and my wife and then these three other guys, but it's never going to make it to the stage, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because there's no payoff with the three other guys other than they're going to hold me accountable. They're going to be helpful to me, but they're not going to feel any different about me from hearing this story, mm-hmm. whereas a lot of times there can be the vulnerability payoff from bringing it to the stage. For sure. Of course. You That's know? good. Well said. I think where we get in trouble and deconstruction, if that's a word, is like when people talk to other cynical people about their struggles with God. But like there's, I think the scriptures are very clear to be like, it's permissible to wrestle with God and to be honest and struggle and be like, what are you up to? And mm. it doesn't feel that in it's, it's not efficient, but like either, either is our design, <laughs> you know, it's like, we're not computers who generate outputs. We're image bearers who feel really deeply. Yeah. Very, very well said. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. I, it it um, threw me off when you said efficient, cause that's my favorite word. And I'm yeah. like, God do this faster. Yeah. Make we're like faster. crazy. Like, yeah. I, I mean, like wait. this is like life on life's terms. God made us like intentionally unbelievably inefficient, right? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, he, he could have made us in any particular way, and he made us like where we have to spend a third of every day totally unconscious and unproductive. And if we don't do that, like we're not okay. Um, like, like I mean, it's kind of nuts, right? Like it's not the way I would have done it. 
<laughs> right. But he did. So well said. it's like, let's live life on life's terms. Yeah. yeah. So talking to you two, both former pastors, yeah. um, do you feel like this is an issue with pastors, not just seniors, but all pastors or male pastors that do they struggle with emotions? Do they think um, like one time you had talked about our emotions fundamentally bad? Right. What do you Man. think? I, the amount of times when I would preach or participate in church things and be wrestling with some kind of self-doubt, mm. for me, we're, we're legion. Mm. It, as simple as this. I remember one time I was putting uh, a body into the grave. Mm. And right there, questioning, like, do I really believe that this person is going to come back from the dead? Mm. And if that's really true, why is it so hard mm. in this material world to hold on to that? Yeah, it's hard for a pastor in, a, in the midst of a sermon to say that out loud right. without causing all of his sheep to be like, he didn't, he didn't even believe what he preaches. Yeah, but we as human beings, we have these deep, haunting questions that we don't know what to do with. It's yeah. not not that I don't believe in the resurrection; it's that I str- I wrestle yeah with it right. Uh, and so I feel like pastors, I feel like as a pastor, I wasn't allowed and it wasn't their fault. It was my fault, but just to say stuff out loud that I needed to say out loud so I could name it and deal with it. Right. That's how I felt. I don't know how you felt. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, we're speaking in generalities, but I think a very common theme, because a lot of the work that I do is with pastors, coaching, counseling wondering. pastors, mm-hmm. a lot of times terrible intersection of our own stuff where a lot of times we get into pastoring to fix something from our past, yeah, uh, to heal some wound. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're trying to make some people finally love us enough to make the love we didn't get. Is that true? Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, you see that that's a pattern of pastors. Oh, yeah. They're anybody, almost anybody in helping professions. Um, there was a wound that pushed them there. Yeah, almost like I did this cohort with uh, Chip. Uh, in 2021, there was six of us in there, uh, all men leading in lead chair positions in different helping professions. And every single one of us, when we told our story, it went back to a very specific hmm. way of being. Do you raised. think they realized that when they began? No. You, okay. So they go into it, maybe not everybody, but some. Yeah, a lot. We go into it wanting to protect people from going through what we went through Hmm. and we want to give what we never got. Hmm. Which God can use for good. Yes. And as long as we come to terms with that was a big part of what brought me here. Yes. But if you don't come to terms with it, there's this secret motivation in the back of your heart. That's really not healthy. Oh, it's the, if, if somebody who is leading in attempts to heal is incredibly dangerous. So a lot of times, Guys who will go into church planting, for example, it is very common that they grew up in homes where uh, parents were divorced or dad was functionally absent from the home. Um, They then attempt to create the family they never had and to provide the security of relationship that they never had in their childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, which to your point, if redeemed, I'm going to use some of Nouwen's terminology of being a wounded healer, that can be really beautiful because it gives you empathy and it creates a safe, sheltering landing space for people who've had similar experiences and upbringings, and there can be beautiful redemption. The problem when you're trying to give away what you never got and you're trying to lead in the name of healing is that is an impossible task because nobody in a church is going to love you enough to make it okay that your dad didn't love you. Yeah, Mm -hmm. It'll never be enough. So we get weird, we get controlling, we get manipulative, we, we get, uh, inappropriate. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, that's, I don't mean that in a sexualized way, although it can be, but I mean inappropriate in terms of like, if I was the pastor and you were in my church, I'm meant to love you in a way and expect to love from you in return that's different than the way that a son is supposed to expect it of his dad. Mm. And when those categories get confused and interchanged, um, we get, we get in a lot of, a lot of trouble. Um, but I mean, I can keep talking about it, but I actually read years ago, uh, Lindley's family's big tennis family. And so I've gotten into reading tennis biographies. Oh really? Yeah. And so I read years ago in one of the tennis biographies about how 
tennis players are instructed to not hold the racket too tight. Mm -hmm. That the the right. harder you hold it, the less effective you are in swinging it. Right. I have found personally, one of the indicators that I'm not healthy is that I'm holding on to my ministry really tight. Right. Like the the thought of it going away, or the thought of me failing, or the thought of being replaced becomes inconceivable. Right. Whereas I feel like a healthy mindset for ministry is like for a season, it's a privilege to be in the spot. Yeah. Uh, I get to lay a foundation that other people will build on. And it's easy in ministry, I think, to make it unknowingly about you and your legacy. Oh, for sure. Which is about, I need some kind of healing in my life and I'm going to let this church be the answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> Which is significance. Yeah. I want significance. Right. I didn't get it before, and so I'm right. going to try to get it from this project. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. On Sunday, I preach for a church in town whose pastor is transitioning to another church. So I came. I preached the end of Acts 20. Everybody's crying you know, on the beach as Paul's getting ready to leave. And it was funny because I, I, was, I was telling this church, I was like, you've given me permission to speak into this. And I know in these situations, you know, the way you want to react is by saying, we want to make sure this never happens again. We never want to go through transitions ever again. These are really painful. And I just always laugh when people say that to me, like the only way you don't go through a transition ever again is your church ceases to exist, right? Like if a church exists for a hundred years, it goes through a lot of transitions and you hope your church does exist for a hundred years. Yeah. The same way in our own lives as well. This is where it's like life on life's terms is life is full of loss it's full of transition. It's full of seasons. Like this is the way that God has architected reality and we either can embrace it and live in light of it, or we can try to control it. And then our, our hearts get broken as yeah. a consequence because it just doesn't work. You said you do a lot of work with pastors. Do yeah. you, do the pastor's wives come with them? Sometimes. What Sometimes. is, is there a pattern or anything that you guys have kind of discovered with pastor's wives if the husband is unhealthy emotionally, is she typically unhealthy emotionally as well? Is the problem that one is and one isn't? Um, just maybe um, speaking to the pastor's yes. wives listening. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of times, speaking of generalities, right, of course. Uh, I think a lot of times the wife sees it clearer than the husband does. <gasps> Amen. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's say yeah. that again. Um, and a lot of times what will bring them in because nobody wants to come in for counseling or therapy. Of you know, course, nobody opts yeah. in. No, they don't want to pay problem. for it. Right. It's a, <laughs> it's a problem. You know, it's like they, this is not one of they, what they want to be doing with their time off. Mm -hmm. Right. I get that. And, um, and even a lot of times they show up thinking that the wife is the problem. Why can't she see how great I am yes. and get on board this is our with how great this is? And then you get about 10 minutes in and you're like, oh, she's the one telling the truth. He's dying. This is hurting their family. Um, he doesn't have proper boundaries. He is giving his best to strangers that will hopefully give the approval that they never got in their childhood. Hmm. And she's the one who can kind of call BS on it. Um, but she gets labeled as the problem. That's pretty much us. That feels... <laughs> yeah. There's like a moment of silence. Yeah. Or... <laughs> I'm just trying to read you to be like. It's not just that us. Land? That's a yeah. lot of people. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. that yeah. is a lot of. I, and it's me you were too. Saying, yeah. It's I, I'm. You know, we're we're most helpful in the things that we were worst at that got like a little bit of competency in, and that's it. It's like, oh, my wife wasn't like not believing the mission enough and all that sort of. It's like, oh, when she saw me hospitalized because of the pressures mm -hmm. of the pace of life and ministry, and she was like, we need some significant life adjustments. Mm -hmm. It was not because she didn't believe the mission strong enough. She right. didn't want to be widowed before I turned 40. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, with four little kids before right. I turned 40. Like, objectively, she is right and seen it for what it, for Do what it is. Do you allow her to speak into your life then about health things? Yeah, I try to. Diet I mean, things, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'm giving you like ammunition that will be <laughs> <Love> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> asking for a friend. I That's mean, right. hypothetically. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to. And, um, yeah, and I think, again, this is where it's generalities, but a lot of times, and, and I think also the challenge of what the wife is dealing with is to feel like if she tells the truth, she's an impediment to the good things that are happening. Yeah. 
in a lot of she's ways. She's the problem. She's the problem. Like, why can't she just get on board and and see how great this is? And so she's kind of caught in this weird place of, um, you she's know, stuck between marriage and ministry in some yes. ways. I mean, these are the. I think this is the mechanics of that. Mm -hmm. This is like what is happening under the surface where she feels caught between two places. Either my family can die and the ministry can thrive or the ministry can die and my family can thrive. But my thriving and the church's thriving are fundamentally incompatible and impossible. And I have to pick one That's of two really, really terrible options. We got a few minutes left. I always want to end on practical notes. Yeah. So if there's a couple out there that's listening to this, maybe a pastor's wife, like, where can she get help? Like, what resources do you guys have? Is there a place that you might push someone to say, hey, here's where to begin this discovery? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say, so let me answer it in terms of, like, what's accessible to anyone and everyone, and then, like, there's professional resources as well. I'll start with the professional resources, actually, because that'll be shorter. Um, I don't know, like, their context. I think you just start reaching out to people who you trust who have gotten help. We do stuff online. So Voice of the Heart Center, vothcenter.com. Um, and we have a, a team of, uh, you know, we're new, but like um, we hired, uh, you know, we have a team of therapists. We just hired our first female therapist as well. Actually, Colorado Transplant. Very nice. Uh, as well, who's, who's coming here to Nashville soon. I um, have a question about that. So because one thing that we hear a lot is that we are in a small town. Everybody knows us. Everybody knows everybody. So we don't have anyone to go to. So they could do that. They could do it online. It's an online thing. Yes. Okay, yeah. that's great. So yeah, and I, I mean, and that's a very real dynamic. We yeah. didn't, we didn't get into any of this, but it's like, when I'm talking about telling the truth, I'm not saying you just go into your staff meeting and you're like, I think this is going to kill our family. Mm -hmm. Like that's injecting, I think, inappropriate anxiety into a system with people who can't maybe handle yeah. that. So you have to find the appropriate places of who do you tell the truth to and in what particular way. You know, how much do you showing kind of like the inner life of your um, of what's going on in your world? I think the thing that we're so passionate about with the process is like you don't need to pay for therapy to do it. Like to tell the truth or feel your feelings, tell the truth, trust God with the process like anybody can do. And if, and if you can form especially safe relationships, a safe circle of security, now that brings a lot of questions, right? Like who is safe in my church? Mm -hmm. Can it be in my church? Is it be outside of my church? That we're not even getting into any of that. But like, I, I think about half of counselors would be put out of business if people just knew how to tell the truth to their friends and those friends knew how to listen. Like it's like the simplest skill. Uh, n hmm. not the easiest, but very simple, you know, yeah. just to be able to tolerate yeah. and to be able to engage and uh, step into that moment. Um, by the way, I feel like a little bit like weird plugging this, but like if, if what we're talking about, you want more on me and Chip do a weekly podcast where we like talk oh, about great. all yeah, this tell stuff. Them about yeah, it. no, it's called, uh, it's called living with heart. Um, and if you search it, it'll pop up awesome. and, uh, we do like an hour a week talking about exactly this stuff in further detail. And it's really more him talking than, than That's me. Great. Um, which is great. And uh, yeah, so I'm like scratching the surface of that's good. Like, we've got a whole episode. We have an hour on a circle. How do you form a circle of security, for example, mm. of just secure relationships that you can tell the truth to? And you don't have to worry, like, am I going to lose my job because that's good. I told you what's mm -hmm. really going on? So I think starting appropriately, that's where it's like using that house imagery of proper boundaries of like what, what I would not encourage you to do. Let's say you're a pastor's wife and somebody else just came on staff. And so you've got another pastor wife in the trenches with you is like the very first time you get a coffee to be like, here are the 10 worst things that have ever happened to me and my 10 <laughs> biggest fears. And, and reasons why I hate my husband. Yeah. And reasons why I hate my husband. <laughs> and, and you're not going to like this church. Right? Yeah. I mean, like see, even that has been like, I mean, we've counseled people who, you know, a wife just thought she could be honest about mm. how, uh, she thought there was a safe place in her church that she could say, I really struggle with this about my husband and it led to a group of people like trying to get him fired. Hmm. Um, and that's the hard thing in a church is a lot of times that's as much as we don't want it to be, they are seeing it through the lens of should this guy be working here yeah, or not? Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so I think that's where there's wisdom and discernment that we have to like navigate uh, in all of this. But I think trying to form two or three trusted people that I can do the process with that I can feel my feelings, I can tell the truth in an appropriate way, and we can see what happens. And 
again, it's sort of like a board game. I, I'm talking about something that is not like, it, it seems so simple and so stupid. Most people listening to it might be like, I don't want to do that or I don't know how to do that or that seems lame until you do it mm-hmm. and you're like, it's pretty magical. Like wow. I'm practicing the Psalms in a lot of ways. Um, God will show up in really creative and unique and, you know, you know, you might call it a coincidence, but it's actually God, mm-hmm. you know, it's stepping really in and moving in. Um, and you start to come alive and you don't want to go back to the way you were living before. Hmm. I want to say this. Uh, I know we're wrapping up. I, I've come to the conclusion recently that I don't know how to feel until I write it. Hmm. So one of the things that's been challenging me in this season at Lifeway is I've preached a lot of the same sermons. Yeah. So I, you know, I go to different places. They haven't heard the sermon. The act of writing a sermon, I did it yesterday, forces you to deal with issues in your heart. Yeah. That wouldn't normally be. So sometimes it may be helpful to go and sit down and write down in an unfiltered way your feelings. Right. And then choose what one piece of that or two pieces of that would you like to tell somebody? Yeah. Uh, because like for me, I have a hard time. Lindley's really good at knowing right now on the tip of her tongue what she's feeling. Mm. But for me, it takes writing or reading yeah. to be able to see it through somebody else's eyes. So, uh, man, this is really good discussion. We could probably do this for two more hours. <laughs> yeah. I really want to share your episode on the circle of security. If like if yeah. that's allowed, yeah. I yeah, think that sure. would be really, really interesting. Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. That and is a question we get all the time. Like, how do you find, sometimes we've heard it as like safe people picker. Right. Um, and I think that is one of the most challenging things for pastors Find and families. a safe person. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, is, it is really hard. And I and again, since I know the audience here, like our audience for that is not exclusively pastors, I will say that I think one of the tragic realities, I wish it was different, is the way that you as the ministry family leader experience pain and the way other people experience it. It's, it's hard for it to be aligned yeah. because – you are thinking about your family and most other people are thinking about the organization. Mm -hmm. Um, And your expression of need or weakness or fear is a lot immediately where they go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I wish it wasn't that way, but I think think it's good. Well, Brian Barley, Brian, thanks for being on the show and we look forward to having you back again. We talk more about emotions in the future. Yeah, I love it. Thanks everybody. Yeah. The Glass House, executive produced by Angie Elkins, edited and engineered by Donnie Gordon with help from Nathan Howard, show notes and production help from Nikki Ogden, photography by Emily Bergeron and Bailey Watley, recorded at the Lifeway Podcast Studio in Brentwood, Tennessee.